Good evening, dear friends and Lissalians. My name is Brother Ben. Uh, I'm a, a member of the Waterford community here in De La Salle College, uh, and I'm also part of our leadership team in the district. It is my great privilege to welcome you all this evening to the launch of Fergus Dunn's book titled De La Salle Teacher Training College, Waterford, 1891 to 1939. We are here in the parlour of this beautiful building, which had its official opening on Monday, July the 16th, 1894. It is wonderful to be joined online by brothers from across our district, Great Britain and Malta. Of course, there is a special welcome to our teachers, present members of the staff, and those who are now retired. We're also delighted to welcome our students, past and present, and the many friends of De La Salle. Thank you for taking the time this evening to be with us for this very special event. Fergus Dunn is a former member and a teacher at De La Salle College, a former brother, I should say. He has continued over the last 40 years to be a very dear friend and a committed Lasallian. The project of the book developed from discussions between Brother Tim, member of our community here, and Fergus, probably motivated by the vast collection of artifacts and college memorabilia which used to reside in Tim's office and in the many cabinets and rooms of the college. They believed there was a book in all this material. But I have a feeling that Fergus never dreamed that the project would take two and a half years to complete, run to some 280 pages, and in the process, uncover some very interesting and engaging historical facts. De La Salle Teacher Training College, Waterford, 1891 to 1939, captures beautifully the half century long life of De La Salle Training College. It is at once a very valuable insight into Irish education at the beginning of the 20th century, while also being a social history and an engaging local history of Waterford at a time of enormous change. Fergus, thank you for writing this superb, attractive and eminently readable history of De La Salle Teacher Training College. I would like now to introduce you to our author, Mr. Fergus Dunn. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much, Ben. Many thanks to everyone who is online tonight and a proper welcome to you to this official, official launch of the book. Writing the history of the De La Salle Training College, which operated in this building over its lifetime, was really a labour of love for me. Ever since I came here first, back in the late 60s, I have been enthralled by the building and the atmosphere it generates when one comes in the front door. Just over two years ago, almost to the day, at a conversation with the community here in Waterford, I agreed to take on the task of putting the history of the training college down on paper. The brothers were very anxious to have a proper record of the operation of the training college and wanted the collection of letters, documents, photographs, diaries, and official records to be preserved in an accessible form. There is a detailed handwritten account called the Historique de la Salle Training College, Waterford, by Brother Philip Healy, and many original documents giving the most detailed specifications for every aspect of the building. The articles of agreement between the de la Salle authorities and the building contractor, George Nolan, are retained in de la Salle College. In this regard, I am indebted to my good friend, Brother Tim, for giving me access to all of the material stored in the cabinets in his office. I am equally indebted to Brother Oliver Rogers, the archivist in Castletown, who kindly gave me access to a wonderful collection of original documents and letters which he had curated and organised. The book begins by giving a background to the arrival of the De La Salle brothers in Ireland in 1882 and their subsequent arrival in Waterford five years later. It also gives the background to education in Ireland in the 19th century and the development of training colleges for primary teachers in, the, in this country after 1880. The De La Salle Training College opened its doors in Waterford in 1891 to both lay 
and religious trainee students and built up its reputation as a training college for male primary teachers until it was forced to close in 1939. During the 48 years of its existence as a training college, over 4,000 teachers were trained here who were employed in primary schools throughout the 32 counties of Ireland. Over the first three decades of its, of its existence, the Waterford Training College operated under the rules and regulations laid down by the Board of National Education, which was, in, which was answerable to the British government in Westminster. Having developed through years of national upheaval and political unrest, the Training College transferred to the Free State structure after 1922. The high standard and calibre of candidates qualifying for teacher training during this period was remarkable. Yet by 1934, the Irish government was forced to drastically reduce the number of teachers qualifying from the system. The end result was a decision to close the training college in Waterford in 1939 for economic and demographic reasons. I would like just to give a, a brief mention then to a number of areas covered in the book, which you see on the slide in front of you there. Firstly, just to mention how the training college came to be located in Newtown and the construction of the De La Salle College building are all described in the early chapters. The De La Salle brothers arrived in Waterford in 1887 when they agreed to take over a primary school in Stephen Street in the city at the invitation of the local bishop. When the brothers decided to use Stephen Street for practice teaching, they decided to purchase Newtown House, which you see in the photograph there, which was located on the grounds of the current college, roughly where the tennis courts are now. Negotiations then commenced around 1888 to establish a teacher training college for the young brothers, and it was decided to locate it in Newtown House. To get approval, the brothers agreed to provide training for not just their own members, but for lay students as well. I now enter the really dynamic brother Justin McMahon, who arrived here in Ireland in 1890. Within 18 months, he had gained the support of the Catholic bishops of the country, the local MPs, politicians, and the National Board of Education. His dynamism and energy were incredible and led to the opening of the training college in Newtown House in 1891. I feel I got to know Brother Justin personally through the many letters that are available in, in, in the archives and also from the historique written by Brother Philip Healy. Planning and construction of the training college building was overseen, of course, by Brother Justin himself and then by Brother Thomas Kane, who was appointed the first principal. The book gives a very detailed account of many aspects of the building, including the structure of the building itself, the chapel, which was described in the local press at the time as an absolute gem, the altar, organ, stations of the cross, the famous clock, the handball alleys, and the model farm. An important chapter in the book describes the contribution of Brother Potamian O'Reilly, a world-renowned scientist, and his contribution is described both in the college itself and internationally. Known as James O'Reilly, he was born in Cavan in 1846 and joined the brothers after his family emigrated to the United States. He was posted to London in 1870, where he studied at London University, eventually taking a PhD in the theory of electrical measurement. He arrived in Waterford in 1893, where he taught for only three years, but made an enormous impact in that very short time. He's perhaps best remembered for the performance of the very first X-ray ever performed in Ireland in this building on the 13th of April, 1896. The X-ray having been discovered a few months earlier by the German scientist, William Rowentgen. Then in 1896, he returned to New York and taught for many years in Manhattan College. Given the timing of the establishment of the training college, it's not surprising that there was huge interest among the students in Irish language and culture. A branch of the Gaelic League was established in the training college in 1897, the first one, I believe, in Waterford County. At the beginning, Irish was not on the curriculum of the training college, but Irish was taught as a voluntary subject from the late 1890s onwards. Around 1900, there was a notable increase in the number of primary schools teaching Irish, and this continued to increase as teachers trained in Waterford and other colleges took up teaching posts around the country. After 1922, 
Irish became compulsory in primary schools and the Waterford College was well prepared for this development. So much so that by 1930, all teacher trainees in Waterford did all their exams through Irish. And in addition, Irish became the daily conversational language in the college. The book recounts in detail how the college managed through the periods of national unrest between 1912 and 1924. It describes the period before the 1916 rising when the students here at Waterford were reported for allegedly attending Sinn Féin meetings. It describes the role of Thomas Ashe, who was a student in the training college from 1905 to 1907. He took up a teaching post in Dublin and took an active part in the rising. He was arrested and died after a short hunger strike in 1917. There's also the alleged role of primary teachers in the rising and nationalist activities. And this was noted with the training colleges, including De La Salle Waterford, being blamed for spreading nationalist sentiment and anti-British feeling among the trainee teachers. There is an account of a student strike which took place in 1916-1917, which was sparked by food rationing and eventually became the subject of a parliamentary discussion in Westminster. The threat of conscription in 1918 provoked a brief period of unrest in the college when all of the students went home about a week after Easter and didn't come back for seven or eight days. Of particular interest to us today in this pandemic era are the accounts of the effect of the Spanish flu in 1918 and 1919 on the training college with a number of diary entries referring to its impact on the students. It mentions on one occasion that in November 1918, there were 120 of the 200 students in bed with flu. And then there's the visit of the British Army to the college in January 1921, which led to the arrest of three students. And finally, the military takeover of the college for six weeks in 1922, which led to demands for compensation from the Irish Free State Government. Then the transfer of responsibility from Westminster to the new Free State Government happened in the 1920s and the new Minister for Education and the Department of Education came into existence after 1922. The training college transferred seamlessly to this new authority, although the college, like all other aspects of Irish society at the time, had to cope with major changes in policy and in particular severe reductions in state funding. Nothing new to us today either. The contribution of the college to the GAA is recounted. Gaelic games were played in the college from the early years and teachers trained in Waterford were to the forefront in spreading participation in hurling and football in the primary schools. Many past students also rose to prominence in GAA administration. Seven past students of the Waterford Training College were elected GAA presidents between 1932 and 1970. Naturally enough, there was also a strong connection between the Training College and the INTO, the Primary Teachers Union. When we consider that 50% of all male teachers trained in the country over its 48-year history were trained in Waterford. The annual INTO conference, Congress, for example, was held in Waterford twice during that period, in 1906 and 1929. There was very strong INTO support for the Training College when the government announced its closure in 1939. Like the GAA, many past students rose to positions of prominence in the union, with 21 presidents of the INTO, past students of the college, between 1910 and 1975. Before dealing with the actual closure, it's worth considering the proposals which emerged in the 1920s and again in the 1940s to set up a university in De La Salle College, Waterford. There are detailed accounts in the book of attempts to raise teacher qualifications to degree status, from establishing a link up with UCD by establishing a student hostel in Eli Place in Dublin to serious negotiations during the 1920s and again in the 1940s to establish a university in the De La Salle College building in Waterford. This is particularly apt today when we observe the long running negotiations to create a university for the Southeast in recent years. The final blow came with the decision by the De Valera government to close the college in 1939. It was officially announced in May 1939 that the Waterford College was to close from the following September. There are numerous letters on file which were exchanged between the brothers and the de Valera government. Several meetings were held with Eamon de Valera and his officials 
but the government totally refused to change their minds. The final meeting was held on the 27th of June, and the sense of devastation and despair is evident in the letters and the commentary of Brother Philip Healy, who was the provincial or visitor at the time. A, a sense of despair can be felt in the personal letter sent by Brother Philip Healy to Eamon de Valera the day after their final meeting, where he says, I write this personal note to say how sorry I am that my remarks yesterday should have been a cause of offence to you. This was not the least of my troubles as I came away hopeless and helpless from that meeting. We'd all love to know what was actually said at that meeting. There is no official record of such. The college was retained by agreement with the government as a training college for religious brothers until 1971. The brothers eventually decided to use the training college building as a boarding and day school for boys in 1949. The subsequent success of the boarding school is attributed to the many teachers in primary schools who encouraged their students to enroll in the De La Salle College in Waterford. It's probably true to say that many people living in Waterford today and who pass the De La Salle College building in Newtown on a regular basis probably do not even know that there was a thriving third level institution in the city for 48 years and that over 50% of male primary teachers from all over the country were trained there before 1939. That's just a summary of what's in the book, 282 pages, as Ben said, covering all of those areas and many more besides. It would be impossible to cover them all here tonight. But just to say to you that the book, De La Salle Training College, Waterford, 1891-39, is it published in hardback. Um, it's available for purchase in the book centre in Waterford. And the details of the book centre are on the screen for you there now. In particular, the book can be purchased in store, obviously, but for many people who are not in Waterford, it can be purchased online. The thing to notice is the website address is just www.thebookcentre.ie and the email is similar, website at thebookcentre.ie. And I tried today to get online. It doesn't show a picture of the actual book, but if you do a search for De La Salle, the book comes up and brings you to the area where you can purchase it. That's it now, thank you very much. And I'd like just to hand you over now to Adrian Larkin, who is a retired teacher and deputy principal of De La Salle College, who will formally launch the book. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. And many thanks to Ben and to Fergus for inviting me to this evening's book launch. Um, when Fergus told me that he was had completed the history of De La Salle College training, the history of the De La Salle Training College. My immediate response was, well, that will definitely be a job well done. That thought was immediately followed by a kind of a sense of wonder. Was, How come this hadn't been done before? Because there's absolutely no doubt, whereas the history of the training college is of immense significance to, we say, the De La Salle order and the wider De La Salle community. It's also hugely significant to the history of Irish education and to the history of Waterford. So um, we're actually a huge thanks is due to Fergus for producing such a highly and immensely significant work. My own involvement with De La Salle goes back to being a student here and subsequently as Fergus said, a teacher in the, in the school. And my concept of the school along with that of all my colleagues would have been of a secondary school. But we were always acutely aware of the fact that there had been a training college here. There were many mementos around the college and we're still here today of um, that particular time. For example, in the study hall, where you have photographs of all the various Lehman Cert classes from the secondary school, you also have all the graduate classes from the training college. Fergus referenced the kind of connection with the GAA. Again, that's something we'd be very aware of because in that per same particular study hall, you have a range of photographs of the various graduates who became presidents of the GAA. You also that have that uh, very impressive bust of Thomas Ashe. And even go back to my own time as a student here, we, we had a boarding and a, and a day school at the time. And the boarders came from far and wide in the country, but in the vast majority of cases, their connection with De La Salle arose from either having a family member or a family friend or a local teacher who had been a graduate of the college. Now, we had a limited knowledge of particular stories about the, the training college. Like we would have known that it had been closed in 1939 through rationalization, that it had been an offer to, of 
the, the building as a third level institution and we would be somewhat aware of the pioneering work into terms of x-rays of Brother Potamia. But other than that, that was it. So thankfully, Brother Fergus's book today fulfills that massive void there. Now, Fergus has in his presentation given you some flavour of the topics covered in the book. But there's, there's absolutely no doubt it would be, be impossible to convey the full extent of the appeal of the book and the scholarship of the book in the short presentation that we had this evening. He has, through rigorously researching, analysing, contextualising all of the wealth of materials in the archive, uh, produced a book of the highest historic quality, detailing all of the landmarks in the college's history. But what I've been equally impressed with is his ability to present the human story of the important individuals who were throughout the, the college's history. And he hasn't been just content to give us like small little biographical details of these people. Again, the extent of his research is quite evident in, in his, the rounded picture of these people that he has produced, that he has researched colleagues' memories of these people, past pupils' memories, newspaper articles, and even letters in newspapers to give us a flavour of the qualities of these people. Now, in highlighting the abilities and the high calibre of these people, he hasn't shied away from including details of where we say, um, what would you call it, um, vested interest and obstructionism kind of played a part in trying to hinder the work of the college. And examples of the initial objections of the Irish Christian Brothers to the establishment of the college and the subsequent strenuous objections by UCC to the, erect, to the establishment of a third level college here are quite, you know, are in the book and the, the detail is quite fascinating on those. On a lighter note, I was particularly taken with a story that he had about the negotiations between Brother Justin McMahon, whom we referred to earlier on, and the local Bishop of Waterford, Bishop Egan. Brother Justin had been born in Ireland, but had emigrated to the States quite early and was given the responsibility of negotiating the establishment of the new uh, training college and the building in Watford. It was required at the time that in order to set up the college that they would have the approval of the local bishop, Bishop Egan. In addition to that, it was government policy that the new college would have lay and what they call secular students, lay students, secular students and religious students in it. But Bishop Egan was steadfast in his objection to having secular students, as he termed them, in the college. And you can imagine the negotiations went on for quite a while. But eventually, Brother Justin, in exasperation, probably indicated to, to Bishop Egan that given his stance, they'd have to relocate the college to Kilkenny. So having been faced with that ultimatum, Bishop Egan pulled in his horn very quickly. And so Kilkenny's loss became Waterford's gain. Now, I did say initially that the, the history of the college had a wide appeal to a variety of interest groups. You know, I referenced De La Salle College, De La Salle Order, De La Salle Community, History of Ireland, history, Education History of Ireland and the History of Water. And there's absolutely no, no doubt in my mind that the interests of all, the needs of these particular interest groups are all fulfilled by the book. Because what you have, you have a book with the highest quality of research and in writing, but which is also immensely readable and it has an equal appeal to the lay reader and to the historian. So I would urge you to buy the book. And Fergus has told us where you can go about it. You go to the book centre, either in person or online. And also the book centre has branches in Clonmel, I think, in Kenny Wexford. You can go there and I'm sure they'll order it for you too. So I'm officially fulfilling my duty of launching the book and urging everybody to buy because it is an immensely attractive read. Thank you very much. So I'll hand you back to Fergus. Okay, everybody, we're coming near the end. Um, we just take a few questions in a few minutes from anybody, if anybody wants to ask any questions. But first, before we do that, I would like to put on record my own gratitude and thanks to a number of people who supported me along the way and who helped with this online event tonight. Um, I hope I don't leave anybody out, but if I do, please accept my apologies and my thanks. In particular, I would like to thank Mary McDonough, Marina Stack and Paula Hewson, two teachers in, who are currently in the college and Paula who's retired, who did huge work in helping to set up this operation tonight, but who have also done enormous work in curating a lot of the um, artifacts in the college here going back over the years. To Eunan White, Brother Kevin McAvoy, 
and also to Adrian Larkin for the contributions tonight, in particular to Adrian for um, officially launching the book and encouraging you, of course, to buy it. I would like to thank the former principals of De La Salle College, Brother Damien Kelleher and Margaret Betts, who also encouraged me very much in this project, and to the current principal, Mick Welch. I would like to thank my wife, Mary, in particular, who did the proofreading for the book, and the, there are so few mistakes in it that I don't think I can find any. And also to my sons, Aidan and Liam, and daughter, Emily, who supported me along the way and were prepared to read the odd chapter here and there. A particular thanks to Brother Oliver Rogers, the archivist in Castletown, who gave me great access to all the documentation there. I would like to thank Brother Tommy and the community here in Waterford for their support and help, and particularly to Brother Ben for his enthusiastic support all along. And last but not least, I have to pay a special tribute and thanks to my friend of many years, Brother Tim, to whom the book is dedicated. So thank you everybody. And if anybody wants to hang on for a few minutes and ask a few questions or if you have anything you want clarified or whatever, we'll, I'll be here for a while if, any, if you want to do that. So again, thank you to everybody for attending and listening tonight. And I hope you enjoy the book when you do get hold of it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Fergus. Um, there's a question here uh, from Joe, Joe Gilson, and he says, God bless you and your labour of love, Fergus. Well done on this achievement. Now that the book is published, what would you say is the fact or anecdote that you discovered which surprised or touched you the most? Oh, my God. Talk about starting with a hard question. <laughs> um, I tell you, I was very encouraged from the very beginning with the, with the quality of the material that was in the archives. And I, I think I might have referred to it earlier, but I was absolutely stunned by the contribution of Brother Justin McMahon. Um, I genuinely felt that I got to know him personally from reading his letters and the, the, the energy that he put into establishing this college back in the 1890s. Um, in the book, you will read a, a description where he, he travels the length and breadth of the country within a very short time to visit every bishop in every, in every diocese in the country. Uh, and this is, I'm talking about 1890, when you think about it. Um, and he didn't only deal with the training college, he, he, he certainly got it up and running, but he also got involved with, the, with all sorts of other schools around the country setting up primary schools in different parts, places like Kildare and that, and that. So he comes across to me as an extraordinary person. Um, I suppose what also impressed me to answer Joe there, and thank you, Joe, for your kind comments. Um, what also impressed me was the dedication of the, all of the teachers here and the people in charge to the cause of education. And the, the whole process, which is, I think, generally mis or underestimated, that went towards creating a, a, a very, very high quality of teacher training here for the time. And the, this emphasis on third level, which crops up here and, again, here and again from the very beginning almost, from 1912 on. Um, there's also the, the aspect of the college that it was obviously set up as a Catholic training college. And the Catholic ethos and La Salian ethos runs very strongly through all of the history here. And all the students seem to have bought into that without a problem. So I, I, without highlighting anything else, I, think, I hope I'm not overemphasizing that, but um, thanks very much, Joe, for the question. I hope that gives you an answer. Uh, thank you, Fergus. And Paula would like to know if the graduates went to all 32 counties in Ireland. Oh, yes. Um, now, the, the, when the training college was set up in uh, 1891, it was a 32 county training college. In other words, the students came from all over, including the six counties of the north. Of course, when the Free State Government was set up in 1922, the college then became only a college for the 26 counties. And anyone in the north, northern six counties who, who went on for training went to St. Mary's in Belfast from that time on. Um, so it was 32 county college up to 1922 and 26 counties thereafter. 
And interestingly, the fact that it became only a 26 county college meant that there was a reduction in the number of teachers being trained and the number of places available for them in schools. And that combined with the emigration and the fall in numbers in primary schools led to a huge drop off in, in, in the numbers of teachers being trained and an oversupply of teachers, which had to be stopped, had to be cut back. So there was a combination. It was 26 counties from 1922 on. And a question here, Fergus, about uh, funding. Uh, how much did it cost and where did the funding come from? This, the cost of the building? Yes. Oh, that, that, that's interesting to, to uh, it, there's a lot of interesting detail on the funding for the college. Um, when the contract was drawn up first for the building of this building here, enormous building, if you look at it, um, the contract price was £18,900 at the time, which I roughly estimate is approximately €3 million Euro in today's money. And, the very sh and, and we all might recognise this problem. As soon as they had signed the contract, they decided that there was a problem with the roof. The roof structure wasn't what they would like it to be. And this particularly came from the Superior General, who was in Paris, I think, at the time. And they insisted on changes being made to the roof design. And believe it or not, that increased the contract price to £26,500. In other words, it went, jumped by one third. And that is roughly equivalent to €4 million Euro today. So uh, the children's hospital overrun is not something new. <laughs> it even happened back then. And the funding for that, for that the, this is the interesting point. Where did the money come from? The, the funding mostly came from the De La Salle brothers in, in, in Paris. And in 1912, or I think it was 1912, was set, there were several occasions where they signed a lease agreement. And what happened was that they, the, the Paris lent the money to the Irish district and the district lent it to the training college. Um, the total debt at the time, if I remember rightly, was in the region of 36,000 pounds. So if you work that out from the previous calculations, it's probably close to five or six million today. The extra money was for Stephen Street and for an extension to Stephen Street and various other changes that were made. But the money was provided by the, by the Superior General, by the council in, in Paris, but it all had to be repaid. And there was an agreement to repay it at a certain rate over something like 40 years. And the college was, a, was able to do that. The training college was able to do it from the state funding they were getting, uh, paying a certain amount each year for something like 40 years. But the whole, the, the, the book details, um, uh, the contract that was drawn up in 1912, finalized in 1912, and it's referred to as the Paris Agreement. So all the details are in that and are in the book. And congratulations to all who brought this project to fruition. Special congratulations to Fergus Dunn and Harry Knox, past pupil and former teacher of the college union. I see you have a question there. Thanks, Harry. Hey, Fergus, congratulations again. Just a question I had was that you mentioned the efforts to maintain a third level college on the, on the site of the, the training college. Uh, why did that not materialize? Um, th that's a very interesting story. Um, people who know Waterford will know that there's been an ongoing battle to create a university or a third level college here going, going back the, over the last 20 or 30 years and it still hasn't happened. We, we understand there is an agreement at this stage to set up um, um, a technological university in the southeast that's now been signed and it, it will involve the local Institute of Technology. So a lot of people don't realize that there was an attempt to establish a university here, at least two attempts in the past. And I suppose the first one I'd refer to is the, I spoke earlier about the setting up of the hostel for um, teacher trainees in Eli Place in Dublin. That was set up in 1912. Uh, and what it did was provide a third year of training for teachers who were trained here and was done in conjunction with UCD. That was the first connection. The second one is interesting that in 1921, I think it was, a brother Philip Healy, um, uh, was it brother, yes, brother Philip Healy uh, launched a, a, some sort of a campaign, if you like. 
to get the, Irish, the, the Waterford Training College to become part of the National University of Ireland. And that, that discussion went on for several years. And if you think of the time, 1921, um, it didn't get very far with the British authorities who were in charge at the time. But when the Free State Government and Department of Education came in in 1924, the application was renewed. And there were long discussions about setting up a, a university or, the, or making Waterford, the Waterford Training College, a part of the National University of Ireland. But huge objections came in from two sources for this one. The first source was UCC, University College Cork. They absolutely, utterly objected to the notion that a training or that a university would be set up in Waterford, which they saw, of course, as opposition to themselves. And there's very detailed documentation on that. It's a lot of it quoted in the book, where they talk about who, who would want to come to a university in Waterford, living if they were living in Kilkenny or Tipperary or Wexford. <laughs> wouldn't they all want to go to Dublin or Cork? So that was the first objection. But equally strong were the objections of the Bishop of Limerick at the time. And if, the, if you think about it, the Bishop of Limerick, of course, had Mary Immaculate Training College in his diocese. So if Waterford was going to get a university, Limerick was going to get one too. So th that kind of uh, scuttled the first attempt and it was abandoned uh, finally in 1928. But I suspect the main reason for the abandonment was that the department wouldn't pay for it because the, the uh, state was in a pretty bad, uh, the Irish state was in a pretty bad financial state by then. But then there's a second attempt. Uh, when the training college closed in 1939, um, Brother Brendan O'Hurley, I think it was, was in charge here at the time. And there was an awful lot of anguish about what to do with this massive building here. Imagine this building being empty for so long. A huge building and, and high quality building. So the first, when the, when, there was, when the government refused to back down on the training college idea, the, uh, it was suggested that they would set up a medical college here in the building. That was the first suggestion. That didn't get very far. This is a third level medical college. That didn't get too far. But then there was a suggestion that it become a university. And there were a lot of negotiations about that. And in particular, there was a delegation, a major delegation from Waterford, including the brothers, obviously, but also the local Waterford County Council and Corporation, the INTO, the Teachers Union, the ASTI, the Secondary Teachers Union. They all became part of this campaign to establish a university in Waterford. And of course, we've got to remember the war is on at this stage and quite a significant level of poverty in the town near the city here. But once again, the interesting, this is even more interesting when you read the detail. The objections by UCC, again, were absolutely vehement. They published a four or five page memorandum, which is reproduced in the book, outlining all the reasons why there should never ever be a university in Waterford. So things have never changed, have they? Waterford and Cork. <laughs> and uh, Mary has a question here, Fergus. When is volume two coming out? <laughs> to the present time. Volume two, I, I've been thinking about that. Even Ben mentioned that to me several times. That could be a very interesting volume, volume two. <laughs> um, quite a different volume. I. I, I I would love to do something like that. I think we, there is so much material here. I think we could produce several volumes, but um, we did think of maybe doing a book that would have various strands in it. For example, tracing the boarding college and their boarders who are here, looking at the, the role of the GAA, the role of music in the training college, or not in the, in the, in the secondary school, um, and particular recent years. And of course, the whole involvement in sport and all of that. It could be done and it, it would be very interesting. A lot of material. Um, I think I'd need another 12-month um, lockdown to finish that one. <laughs> Kevin. Go ahead, ask the question. Evening, Fergus, and evening to all the uh, people who are attending the, this particular launch. I'll, past teachers and comrades and all that over the years. Great to see you all again, looking so well. And uh, nice to be here with you tonight. Fergus, my question is a very simple one. You know the statue to De La Salle in front of the college. There's a, de a dedication written on it to Brother Thomas Kane. Right. My question is, why was he the one picked out when 
Philip Healy did all the hard graft and so on, and he was totally ignored. Or what do you call him? Uh, no, what do you call him? Um, Justin McMahon, you mean? Just, Justin McMahon, that's right, yes. Yeah, Justin McMahon. Well, ju interestingly, Justin was only here for two years. Um, the, I think the reason was that Brother Thomas Kane um, was appointed principal in 1891. By the way, there's a very interesting story about the appointment of the first principal. Um, he wasn't supposed to be the first principal, you know. <laughs> there was a man called Brother Severus Harney here in Waterford, who was in charge of the young brothers. He was nominated as the first principal in 1891. But he, he had family in Canada and he went home to Canada in August of that year to, um, to visit his family and to do some business. But unfortunately, he was killed in a train crash in Canada in the summer of 91. So Justin McMahon was back here in Ireland trying to set up the college and now his principal is dead, gone, unfortunately. Not only that, the manager of the college, the bishop, local bishop, died that August. So when you look, if you look at the records, you'll see that for the first uh, month or two, the principal and manager of the training college for two months was Brother Justin himself. And eventually, uh, Thomas Kane arrived, Brother Thomas Kane arrived, and he uh, really made his mark in a lot of ways and stayed here until 1912. So he was over 20 years here. Now, when he, dis when he was elected the Assistant Superior General in 1911, I think it was, he was elected, it, he announced it to the staff here and it became known locally that he was leaving. So a group of the teachers who were teaching in the primary schools around Waterford got together and th they wrote a letter to all the past students asking them if they could make a collection for a donation or to, to give a, a present to Brother Thomas. And they got so much money that they decided that the best way to honour him was to have a statue of St. John Baptist de La Salle on the plinth in front of the front of the college door. So that's how that came about. They, the group collected money. They had this statue made. It's a magnificent statue, as you know, and, and it, it's on a granite pedestal, as far as I'm, I'm aware. Um, and that's why Brother Thomas got it. Poor Justin McMahon doesn't get a look in. He, Justin wasn't, wasn't even here for the official opening in 1894 and doesn't appear in the, in the, in the, in the photograph, obviously, there for, for the opening. Thanks, and, Damien, for the question. <laughs> and Fergus, the final question before we hand back to Ben, and it's from Leo. He asks, were there football teams in the college uh, during that period and in what competitions did they participate? Oh, there were. The, 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 the interest in football, in hurling and football, was extremely high right through the, the period of the training college, even though the GA was only in its infancy when the training college was opened. But um, the, the college teams played in the Waterford Hurling and Football Championships. Um, in the early years, they, they didn't have that much success. I think they might have won one particular championship in around 1914 in football. But the real glory years were the 1930s, when the, the students, um, I think the, probably the reason again was that there was a complete change in the type of student that was going into teacher training. Most of them in the 1930s came from the preparatory colleges. So they were all high quality students, if you like, but they were also extremely interested in football in particular. And in 1930, the, the Waterford, the De La Salle College football team won the Waterford football championship five times out of six years in the first six years of that decade, between 1930 and 36. So much so that the local clubs began to object very strenuously to the fact that the training college was participating in the football championship. However, they needn't have worried because the numbers were dropping by 1936 due to the cutback in, in the numbers training and eventually the, that, that ended. Um, somebody, a cynic might say that, well, it wouldn't be too hard to win the Waterford County Football Championship. <laughs> but anyway, they did succeed in doing it for, for five years out of six. Okay. Um, Fergus, thank you very much indeed. So I'll, you'll have to vacate the chair to... I will indeed. And listen, I'd like to thank everybody there. And thanks, Damien, in particular, there for your question. Thanks, everybody. And um, 
Don't forget to buy the book. Well, that has been an absolutely fantastic evening. Thanks so much to everybody for coming, for being involved, for all you've done. Fergus has already thanked you. I think the way we can best um, uh, appreciate his work is by buying the book. Uh, I do want you to know that Fergus uh, took this work on as, as a work of love, and he's not doing it for anything he's going to get out of it, uh, because he all he wants to do is to make sure that we can pay the bills. That's it. And, and uh, so he's even said if there's any money left over, he would like it to go to charity. So uh, it's not for him, but it was a real labor of love. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I personally am so delighted as I stood there tonight, not only because I've been a member of this community for the last 40 odd years, but my both my primary school teachers were trained here. And Sean O'Brien curated, a former president of the INTO, curated all the photographs. And so I, I just sort of have an affinity that I have a connection with this place. And in 48 years, this college, uh, as a tra teacher training college, pu uh, punched well above its weight. Uh, and, and as Fergus said, has made an enormous contribution to education in Ireland. So buy the book and uh, please God, that contribution will continue. But Fergus, thank you so much. Thanks everybody, safe home and God bless everybody. Thank you so much. Well done, fantastic. Oh, brilliant.